between the leaves. So it makes, you know, so the, this is what I'm going to be talking about is trying to understand how the form that plants have relate to how they actually function in the real world. So something like leaf shape, all of a sudden this shape that's very common, all of a sudden makes sense, particularly in this little seedling, as it uh, as a way of minimizing the amount of competition between the various leaves. This is a now, big lecture about trees. There you go. Somebody still uh, hasn't muted themselves. Now, this whole concept of tree architecture, this is an example of a Scheffelera tree in the Amazon basin. And you see how the tree grew up, produced a single stem, and then it branched. Well, right at that point where it branched, it produced a flower, which represented the end of a particular growing point, and then it branched below the flower. Then it produced uh, another flower at two at either end of those two branches, which caused more branching. And then that process just kept getting repeated. And so tree growth, the way trees grow, is they're essentially modular. And as the tree grows, the modular, the modules that make up the form become uh, smaller and more numerous. So this is the basic process for tree growth. And when you get good at this, uh, this process of, uh, you know, tree architecture, understanding it, you can begin to learn how to recognize trees based on their form. Now, for my students, I would never put the identification at the bottom. I'd ask them if they could figure out what it is. But this is the tupelo, the black gum, which has a, it's always readily, um, uh, easy to recognize in the landscape because it has a single trunk that's carried all the way up to the very top of the tree and the branches are fully horizontal uh, in relation to that vertical trunk. The pin oak has a very similar uh, form. So if you answered pin oak as one of my students, and I'd give you partial credit for that. And in contradistinction to that is here's a California buckeye where yes, it just has a single trunk, but very quickly, uh, the, the branches have an equivalency about them and you can no longer tell where the leader is. So as opposed to having sort of a hierarchy with a strong central leader and then um, lateral branches, here you have an equivalency among all the branches and this hierarchy between the trunk and the branches disappears. And you can see that from a distance. I took them in the Berkshires right now and it doesn't look like this quite yet. This is the way it looks around Thanksgiving, but you can see on the left-hand side, the what I call the upright oval of the sugar maple and the spreading sort of umbrella form of the red oak. So this is something, you know, learning how to identify trees in winter based on their form is, uh, it really takes time, but once you sort of get into it, it's something that um, you can, you know, it's not that hard to actually learn how to identify these trees. And even in an urban context, um, I think I took this picture in Brighton. Um, on the left, there's a Norway maple, again, a little bit like that sugar maple, which is an upright oval. And then on the right is a honey locust, where the branches are more horizontal, uh, essentially, than they are vertical. So it's clear when in leaf, you, you don't see any of this. But in the leafless condition, uh, you can begin to understand uh, their branching patterns, they become much more obvious. So I talked about the modules that make up the, That's you know, uh, the form of the tree. I just clicked on the address on the... Oh, well, somebody needs to mute themselves. So um, basically, this is what I mean by a module. So it is the growth of a shoot, and then that growth terminates with the production of the flower. So this is the plumeria plant, the, the frangipani. And then because of the, that flower, the inflorescence represents the end of that growth, then the branching occurs immediately below uh, that flower. So this is the module, and every tree has a certain basic module that defines the architecture of that particular species. So this is the way, you know, the plumeria grows. It, it's like a stick figure tree, basically. But, you know, it grows, it flowers, it branches, it flowers, it branches, it flowers, it branches, and it just keeps repeating that process uh, over time as it gets um, bigger. And in our flora, uh, the staghorn sumac has exactly that same growth pattern where the, the, uh, the fruit, uh, the red, beautiful red fruit bodies represent that it's a terminal inflorescence and then branching occurs immediately below that. And you get this broad spreading crown forming. So this is one of the very simple sort of architectural models that uh, many plants follow.
Now, the thing about understanding trees is that uh, this is the key element is that at the tip of every bud on the tree, uh, you have uh, in that bud, if you separate the leaves, you, you, you sort of cut them off and you keep going deeper and deeper, eventually you come to a dome of tissue called the shoot meristem. And if it's at the tip of that uh, shoot, then it's, a, a, it's called an apical meristem, it's at the apex. And if it exists on the side, it's a lateral meristem. And the thing about these meristems that's really important is, they produce leaves and flowers and wood, but they themselves remain continuously embryonic. So it's as though they produce differentiated tissues, but they never themselves become uh, differentiated. So this is one of the things about that distinguishes, you know, animals and plants is that we as human beings, we reach, you know, the, the end of our developmental potential pretty much by the time we're, you know, in adolescence, by the time we're you know, sexually mature at, you know, 12 to 15 years old, that's it, you know, our life pattern is set, you know, we're going to die at some point. But plants, they always hold back a small amount of tissue that reta retains its embryonic potentiality and can continually produce uh, new tissue. And that's the thing about spring that's so amazing is that the trees are reborn every year, quite literally, and their meristems produce a whole new set of tissues. So uh, plants have an, what's called an open system of development, whereas we as, am, as animals or as mammals, I should say, have what's known as a closed system of development. And it is a, a miracle in spring when those uh, buds uh, come out. They're, they're, the leaves are sort of preformed in the bud and as soon as the weather warms up, they expand and you have a full-blown shoot there. Now, in understanding uh, sort of tree form, there's some basic rules, one of which is known as corners rule, which is trees with small leaves typically have thin twigs and many branches, while trees with large leaves, like that Ilanthus I showed you on the left, that's the tree of heaven, typically have thick twigs and are sparsely branched. In other words, coarsely branched trees have large, often compound leaves, while finely branched trees have small, often simple leaves. In other words, when you look at that Ilanthus tree that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, those long compound leaves, those are essentially um, throwaway branches and it just sheds the whole thing and uh, it's very coarsely branched. And it's a way of producing leaves very quickly without actually having to produce wood. That's a very distinct strategy that fast growing sort of early successional trees often employ. On the other extreme, you have trees that produce small leaves with fine branching and the Japanese maple that you're all familiar with is a great example of that fine branch tree that's, you know, very shade tolerant, whereas the uh, something like the Ailanthus uh, is a, needs full sun in order to grow properly. Now, in addition to the shoot meristem, there is also uh, a root meristem. So at the tip of every root, um, you have a meristematic tissue that, that increases, you know, the, produces the, the new growth of the root. And then there's an apical uh, mer root meristem, and then there are lateral root meristem. So this is a, a mangrove root that I just pulled out of the water down in Florida, but it shows clearly the morphology of the root system. And then there is a uh, what's called a cork cambium. This is the, the tissue that produces the actual outer bark, the protective layer of the tree. This is the Acer griseum, the paper bark maple that the Arnold Arboretum introduced um, back in the early 1900s. And then here is you know, the, the cork oak in Portugal that's being harvested. It takes about five or six years of growth to get a north cork to uh, produce a, you know, a wine bottle cork. Uh, and that doesn't, you're just, the bark sloughs off, that's harvested, and uh, the, the, the cambium layer that produces the wood is, uh, is left intact. And so this is the cork cambium. And then of course there is what I was referred to as the vascular cambium that produces the wood. To the outside, it produces the phloem. To the inside, it produces the xylem. But when that cambium layer is exposed, like you've cut a branch off, that cambium layer, uh, all of a sudden, instead of producing wood, starts producing what's called callus tissue. 
in an effort to overgrow that wound. And here you can see on the left-hand side, I was doing some grafting at the Arboretum on a Japanese maple, and I didn't do a very good job of it. I made a cut, but I, it, it, I went too deep. And so you can see where the cambium layer was exposed. It's producing this callus tissue to overgrow it. And you can see that on a large scale on this American elm that lost a big limb in the storm. So you have these, you know, shoot meristems, root meristems, uh, uh, bark meristem or cork cambium, and then you have the vascular cambium that produces the new wood and allows trees to get thicker over time. And what's really interesting is that when trees, when this vascular cambium uh, comes in contact with a, with a solid object, like this plane tree here is meeting a pipe, that's a problem for the tree. So what happens is that vascular cambium tissue, uh, which normally produces callus, in an effort to sort of deal with this structural problem, it essentially engulfs the immovable pipe and makes it part of its own structure. So this is, you know, called adaptive growth, which is how trees um, deal with uh, sort of structural stress. And what it really shows is that we think of trees as actually being solid objects, but if you slow down, uh, you know, time, and you see what's happening is the trees are actually quite fluid uh, in their ability to deal with um, all sorts of environmental stress factors. So on the left-hand side, this is a red oak. Uh, when I lived in the town of Harvard, Mass, this was a tree growing uh, in the sort of the conservation land near my property. And I often looked at this tree and I saw that funny little line across the center and I wondered what that was. It took me many years before I actually went around to the back of the tree and realized that it was growing against a rock ledge and a piece of the rock was sticking into the back of this tree in an effort to deal with the presence of this rock, the tree had produced all this extra tissue. So this is a, you know, this is the prime example of what's called adaptive, that adaptive growth, which is uh, dealing with stress by producing extra tissue to reduce the stress to zero. And that's called, in engineering terms, the axiom of uniform stress. And, you know, from an engineering perspective, an optimized structure has uniform stress over the whole of its entire surface. In trees, the cambium layer produces extra wood at the point of irritation, which spreads the stress out over as large an area as possible, thereby reducing the risk of breakage. So this picture, that's an ailanthus tree on the left. And this is one of the great magic tricks that trees perform, their ability to essentially grow right through a chain link fence. They, they do that, you know, when the shoot is very narrow, it, pen, it goes through the, the chain link, and then as it expands, it engulfs the chain link, and, um, you know, it has to deal with that uh, source of irritation by producing all this extra tissue. So trees are just incredible in their ability to deal with all sorts of um, issues that come up in the environment, particularly in this case, in the urban environment. And in the countryside, uh, this is a picture of a, a tree here in the Berkshires that some farmer parked part of his haying equipment against this tree and then forgot about it. And the poor tree had to produce all this extra tissue just to deal with the fact that the farmer had, had uh, placed his uh, haying equipment and then forgot about it. And What's amazing about this cambium layer is they can produce this extra callus tissue uh, when need be. But in this case, this oak tree, it produced the callus tissue, was overgrowing where the wound was. But then by the time the two lips of the callus came together, the wood on the inside had already rotted. And so the, the, the callus tissue came together. And then when the callus tissue was inside the trunk of the tree where the, where the wood was rotting, it uh, produced a whole set of uh, roots that were essentially feeding off of its own uh, decaying heart. So, you know, if that isn't uh, adaptation, I don't know what is. And here you can see uh, when you have a big storm and some of these big old trees break apart, you can see that the cambium tissue has actually produced structural roots that penetrate the whole, are actually holding this old sugar maple up, uh, essentially uh, feeding off of it the, 
you know, the compost uh, that the center of the tree has turned into. So this is sort of the ultimate in recycling, but it shows this incredible uh, sort of this, the, the, the uh, embryonic nature of this, this cambium tissue that has the, you know, the ability to produce new wood, it produces callus tissue, or when conditions are right, it can produce a whole new root system on the inside of the trunk. And uh, another example, this adaptive growth, uh, you see this particularly in the tropics, but sometimes you see it in temperate trees. This is the Morton Bay fig that produces these amazing buttressed roots uh, under the right conditions. And this is an example, uh, this is shown that, you know, if, if you have a vertical stem and then you have a root coming in horizontally as the tree blows in the wind, that puts a lot of stress on that junction point where the root and the stem come together. And that, that's likely to fail from an engineering point of view. So if you look where my uh, cursor is, by adding extra tissue along this line here, it, you see this red, which indicates high stress measured in a tensiometer. The stress disappears because it's spaced out over the whole length of the here. So these buttress roots form in response to trees blowing in the wind and their function is to uh, reduce the stress that would cause by this uh, unstable junction between the root system and the shoot system. So. That's kind of amazing from my perspective. The other thing that trees, uh, you know, are able to do, and it sort of reinforces my point that trees are fluid rather than, uh, than solid objects. This tree was, uh, it's a spruce tree, was, you know, knocked over by a snowstorm. The snow melts. The tree has to recover its balance. It gets knocked over a second time, and it just keeps reorienting itself until it finds, uh, reestablishes its vertical er er uh, orientation. And what's really interesting on the left hand side here, if you look, here's the center of the tree, right where the cursor is. Trees change the orientation, particularly conifers, by putting extra wood on the underside of the branch, which lifts the upper side of the branch back into the vertical orientation. So this is called reaction wood. So when a tree is knocked out of vertical, it just puts extra wood on one side as opposed to the other to get the tree back to the vertical. And on the right hand side, this is an extreme example. This is a sergeant's weeping hemlock. Here's the center of the, the branch right here. There's as many uh, growth rings at the, above it as there are below it. And all of these, you can see how the extra tissue is added to the lower part of the branch because the snow load is putting so much weight on these horizontal branches that in order just to keep them in the horizontal position, it has to put extra tissue on the on the bottom side of the branch. So this is, you know, trees are incredibly sensitive to environmental pressures and they have amazing capacities to sort of deal with uh, all of these stresses that happen to it in the course of its lifespan. Now, one of the things that uh, not only applies to human psychology, but also to, uh, I hate to use the word arboreal psychology, but this question of, you know, what aspects of, you know, a, a tree shape are due to the environment and what aspects of it are due to genetics. It's the old nature versus nurture uh, discussion that uh, will never go away because it's, uh, you can never really say uh, what's what exactly, but this is a black birch, a common uh, native species growing in the forest. This is the way the form that black birch has when it's growing under, you know, forested conditions with a lot of trees growing right nearby it. And this is a black birch growing at the Arnold Arboretum where it was planted as a specimen in the middle of a lawn off by itself. And it began branching right away because as far as the tree was concerned, it thought it had reached, you know, the canopy. It was up at the top of the forest. So it started producing a crown. So the height at which a tree starts producing its crown depends on how much light it gets. So at the Arnold Arboretum where we love specimen trees, trees are typically low branched um, because they're getting such good sunlight, whereas under forested conditions, they'll produce a 40 or 50 foot high trunk before they start producing their crown. So that's a good example of environmental effects. Or this is the Monterey Cypress. I took this picture at the Presidio in San Francisco. This is the way they grow when they're part of a forest uh, growing in a closed canopy uh, conditions. And this is the same species, 
roughly the same age growing on the headlands uh, above uh, the Golden Gate Bridge where the wind, if you've ever been there, it never stopped blowing. So this is the form that the tree takes when it's exposed to, you know, wind uh, continually. So this is called a krumholz or a twisted wood. And again, this is totally a environmental, not a genetic response. And our own uh, American beech tree, Fagus grandifolia. This is, uh, if you spend any time in the woods, this is uh, what it looks like when you come upon it in the forest. And here's a specimen of uh, the American beech uh, taken on Martha's Vineyard. And this is just behind the dunes on the vineyard where uh, the wind comes off the ocean and it just cuts the, you know, prunes the tops of those trees off so they never stick up more than about 20 feet. And as a result, all of the lower branches remain on the tree. And this is the form that the beech tree will take uh, when it's only protected up to the height of about 20 feet. Um, and you see this if you spend any time in the Rockies or the Sierras, uh, this is a subalpine fir. And you know, how does the tree develop this form? And the answer is, you know, if you spend enough time there that you can see where the snow level is that, and that little skirt at the very bottom of the tree that was underneath the snow. So those branches are protected and the vertical shoot is um, sticking up above the snow line and uh, has to deal with, uh, you know, a different set of conditions in the branches below. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what happens under, as you get to, up to where the tree line is, is the only parts of the tree that survive are those that are beneath the snow and everything else gets wiped out. So if you were to collect cones from this tree and bring them back to the own arboretum, uh, it would produce a normal Engelmann fir. It would not produce a low growing spreading plant like that. So this is, you know, these Krumholz uh, that you see at Timberline, these are all uh, environmentally induced um, forms. And the other thing that can influence the, the form of a tree, of course, is uh, this is an olive tree in California, is human beings. We can insert ourselves into the architecture of the tree. And this is the garden by Lowly. Uh, in the peninsula south of San Francisco. And this is, I call this the lampshade look. And, uh, you know, yes, you can insert yourself into the form of the tree, but, you know, once you're the one that's going in there and deciding which marrow stems to leave and which ones to remove, um, you, you can't put those marrow stems back on the tree. So you then take full responsibility for what happens to that tree over time. And, uh, Emily mentioned that um, I was the curator of the Lars Anderson bonsai collection. Of course, Lars Anderson was a famous Brookline resident and his collection uh, was imported from Japan into the United States when he was uh, ambassador in 1913. And here's one of the prime specimens, uh, 275 years old and it's about four feet tall. And uh, believe me, these things are uh, a lot of work to take care of. But I took a cutting of it and then I planted it uh, next to the bones I housed at the Arboretum. And here it is, 35 years old and already four meters tall. So 30, four times as tall after 35 years old. So that what bonsai is doing, that's completely uh, environmental. It's the pruning of the shoots along with the pruning of the roots that keeps the plant small. And if you let that plant grow freely, it's going to uh, become a normal sized Hinoki cypress. And this is another uh, example from the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, the tree in the background is a Amur cork tree. This is one of our famous trees that uh, came down about 20 years ago, but children love to climb this tree um, and have their picture taken on the lower branches. And people thought, oh, well, if I take a cutting of that tree, it'll have that same form. And so uh, in the foreground, this is what a young uh, cork tree looks like. It has nothing like the form of that one in the background. That's, that's a result of everything that's happened over the course of its life. Uh, it's not genetic. And uh, the genetic form, it's a tall forest tree from Asia. And this is, again, the shape of a tree that it takes. 
is, is like the personality of the person. And it's the product of this interaction between nature and nurture. So being able to sort of separate out what's a genetic trait and what's an environmental trait is really key to understanding uh, the form of trees. And I'm gonna walk you through now uh, the, just the development of form and a couple of species you're probably familiar with. This is the little leaf linden, Pyria cordata, uh, you know, freshly planted um, downtown Boston. And um, here's an example of a, a linden. This is, I think, at Mount Auburn Cemetery. And in the leafless conditions, this looks like a typical a little leaf linden. But here in the, uh, when it, I mean, when it's in leaf, it looks like it. But when it's in the leafless condition, you can see that they're actually separate modules. It's, a, it's actually three different trees here, but they're highly coordinated and they have a, a, you know, the outer edge of the tree is is uniform, but essentially you've got uh, the central portion of the tree, but something's happening and it sort of, it's almost as though a new tree is forming on either side of the central leader. And this process is known as reiteration, where the tree as a result of the aging process begins to repeat its basic form. Now this is, uh, this tree I think has since been cut down. It was at Faulkner Hospital, but you can see when they built this addition, they called the maintenance people in. They did a terrible job pruning this tree. They just shortened all the branches off. And then the tree, um, you know, for very good reason thought that, <laughs> you know, somebody was trying to kill it. So it produced a whole nother group of uh, vertical shoots along where these branches have been shorted, shortened. So you can see that it's actually a, a two layered structure here. Uh, you've got the original form of the tree and then you have the reiterative branches that formed in response to the pruning. So when you look at a tree, being able to recognize what these reiterations, uh, where they are is really important. And linden, just to you know, follow this species for a little while longer, is notorious because it always produces this skirt of new shoots coming off the base of the tree, uh, particularly when it's under stress. In this case, you know, it's between the sidewalk and the street, which is a terrible place to have to grow trees. And in response to um, you know this stress, the tree is producing. Uh, extra shoots, uh, I call these uh, insurance policy shoots in the base in case something happens to the main stem. And in this example, you can see, you know, people always ask me, well, what can I do to keep my linden tree from sprouting like that? And the answer is nothing because there's a huge uh, structure underneath there that usually you don't see, but in this case you do, called a lignotuber. And it produces these extra shoots in response to uh, stress and trauma. So that lignotuber, those shoots coming out of the base of the, of the linden tree are its insurance policy against future damage. And this is the way an American linden growing, you know, along the Housatonic River uh, here in Connecticut, where I am right now, this is the way it looks because it's always being damaged by, you know, ice flows and all sorts of things that are happening to it. So its ability over time to form extra trunks is really part of its uh, strategy for surviving uh, periodic disturbance. So, you know, when we plant a tree like this in the urban environment, it still has this uh, tendency to produce uh, extra shoots. Another example of reiteration I'm just gonna show you is this is a tulip poplar at, at the Arboretum about 30 years ago. There used to be a grove of them by the administration building and they've all blown down now as a result of various hurricanes. But in this case, there used to be a, a, a tulip poplar right next to this one that blew down. And in response to the fact that all of a sudden it's getting more light, uh, the tree essentially produced these two extra branches to take advantage of the new conditions that now exist because its neighbor uh, was blown down in a storm. So I call this the tuning fork tree but it's clearly part of this reiteration process. And here you can see an old uh, tulip poplar in Rhode Island that grew up as a nice straight tree, then the, the leader died. And then you can begin to see how the form of this tree uh, is really, there's really five or six different trees there that have reiterated to form a you know, magnificent specimen. But uh, when it's in leaf, you don't see any of this. It's only in the leafless condition that you can begin to understand uh, 
uh, how this tree actually grows, or this white oak um, in Gettysburg, you know, something had the, the leader of this tree died and this lateral branch found itself at the top of the tree all of a sudden, and rather than reorienting that lateral branch because it was pretty thick, it just produced a whole new group of shoots with a vertical orientation that uh, essentially formed a new town. Um, or this old sugar maple, <laughs> You can see this lateral branch here that all of a sudden uh, escaped, controlled by uh, the mother plant here, and formed uh, a separate module there on the side. And these branches, where they turn upright, they always, you find them, the trees put extra tissue that bends the branch uh, up into uh, the vertical orientation. And then there's, you know, response, reiteration and response to trauma. You can see this blew down in a hurricane and the new shoots come as close to the base as possible and that allow the tree to sprout back or this gray birch, Betula populifolia. Obviously along the muddy river, it, uh, it got knocked over in a storm and uh, it produced three new shoots uh, to replace uh, the old one that got knocked over and to reestablish the vertical orientation or this mulberry tree that came down uh, in Watertown, um, <clears throat> of course, was removed, but cutting those uh, old stems back induced the sprouting of new shoots from the base. And probably the most prolific uh, sprouter of all is the weeping willow tree that was damaged in a storm. They cut it up, but they left the stump intact. And look at that, you know, the powers of uh, regeneration and the willow are unbelievable. And this is the sort of the ultimate example of a reiteration induced by trauma. Um, there are other reiteration is really important to trees. It's how they sort of perpetuate themselves in the face of all sorts of unpredictable disasters. So populous tremuloides, the quaking aspen. Uh, here it is in you know Wyoming. And the thing about quaking aspen is it produces new stems from its root system. So these are root it's a root suckering species. And there's <clears throat> one uh, clone, it's a single clone that uh, occupies thousands of acres. And I think, um, I should say hundreds of acres and it has thousands of stems, up to 80,000 individual stems. And it's all one uh, giant organism, one single genetic organism reproducing by root sprouts. Uh, and our own uh, American beech, Fagus grandifolia, uh, also produces new, we think of these as seedlings, but actually they're root suckers coming off of the root system of the tree. You try to dig those up and you can't do it because they're attached to a very large root. Whereas the European beech, Fagus sylvatica, does not have this capacity of its root system to produce new shoots. Instead, it can only reproduce uh, by what's called the layering of the branches. And you can see where this mother, this old branch touched the ground, it took root and then formed a new uh, daughter branch here. If you, um, uh, there's that famous park in, um, Oh, it's not Forest Hills. Oh, I can't remember the name, but right in Brookline, it's got this beautiful planting of old uh, beech trees, but all of them are doing this. And this is again, a form of reiteration. But what's really interesting, if you look at this branch here, I'm showing you, it's very narrow, but once the branch takes root, you see how thick it is. This is the original diameter of the branch. So all of the nutrients that this module is accumulating it's not sending them, any of them back to its mother over here. It's keeping them all for itself. So it's, a, it's, being, it's not a very dutiful daughter, but that is the nature of uh, this reiterative process. And here you can see this old hemlock tree on Mount Wachusett. Here's the original stem and it's surrounded by, you know, a circle of daughters, each of which is uh, a layered lateral branch. And you can see all of these uh, daughter branches are now fully mature trees and, and the mother uh, trunk in the center is slowly uh, being squeezed out of existence by, but it's all one genetic clone, so it really doesn't matter that much. And just to sort of review uh, what, are, what I would call the basic principles of tree growth, they're meristematic, uh, they retain their uh, full embryonic potential, they're modular in their construction, they're 
uh, opportunistically oriented in the direction of gravity, light, water, and nutrients. Uh, they're balanced in relation to gravity. They're expansive in their growth, always expanding outwards, and they die from the inside. They're morphologically plastic in their response to environmental conditions. And tree wood is adaptive in its response to mechanical and environmental stress, and it produces it provides a detailed record of everything that's ever happened to a tree over its lifespan. And so you all have heard, I'm sure, about tree rings and how tree rings uh, give us a good indication of past climate, the, the diameter uh, of each ring. You can tell how much rainfall there's been. But I like to show this picture of a magnolia species in um, Japan. And you see these uh, concentric rings, these are, you know, here's the tree. Uh, it was started in about uh, 1910. And then here's the, uh, the line for 1920, 1930. And by taking this tree and cutting it into sections, you know, about five centimeters apart, you can reconstruct the entire history of the tree. This is a good project for some graduate student to do because it's a tremendous amount of work. But the entire history of the tree is embedded in its form. And if you know how to read that form, you can actually reconstruct the whole history of a tree. That's one of the things that makes uh, stunning trees in the wintertime such a great subject. Now, getting back to this idea of architecture, uh, this is a, a field that was uh, first uh, sort of articulated and defined in the 1970s by a Frenchman, Francis Allais, a Dutchman, uh, Rolf Oldeman, and an Englishman, um, Barry Tomlinson, who was uh, one of my professors uh, when I was a graduate student. And basically, they defined their 24 architectural models that define all trees that grow on planet Earth can be ascribed to one of these 24 basic models. And you say, well, how did they come up with that number? And essentially, they, they based their, their whole system on four traits. Flower position, is it lateral or terminal? Branch orientation, is it vertical or horizontal? Trunk construction, I'll talk about that later, sympodial or mono, monopodial, and then growth cycle, is it rhythmic or continuous? So four times three times two, four factorial, that means there's 24 possible ways of arranging these four basic traits. So that's how you come up with uh, 24. And I'm gonna walk you through now, in the temperate zone, we only see, you know, maybe seven or eight of these mod models, but in the tropics uh, where weather is not a constraint, that's where you trees really get to express um, their growth forms. But, you know, just to run through some of the very simplest uh, models and most common, this is the, uh, you know, this is San Francisco, that's the Canary a Island date palm. And, you know, there's actually one Meristem at the very tip of the shoot. And if you if you can't prune a, a date palm, this is the Canary Island date palm, uh, because there's no uh, lateral branches to take over if it's pruned. And so if something happens to that la that apical meristem, like these old coconut palms growing in Jamaica, the whole trees die. So this is all your eggs in one basket. You've got one big giant apical meristem, and if something happens to it, uh, that's the end of the line. So in the case of these coconuts, uh, this was a huge crisis in the 1970s when the palms were dying from this phytoplasma disease, and that's the point at which the uh, Malayan dwarf, the golden coconut, was introduced into cultivation in the Caribbean because it was resistant to this uh, disease, and uh, so now, all this, you know, after the last you know, 50 years, all the coconuts you see in the Caribbean are this golden variety because it's resistant to that disease. So that's one of the simpler models. And there are some palms uh, like this European fan palm that can branch from the base, but uh, most palms do not have any powers of reiteration. And another going up, uh, you know, another simple model would be um, 
like the, the conifer model, that's this Douglas fir, this is growing in Bryce Canyon, and all of the growth favors the trunk, and the lateral branches are definitely secondary in relationship to the dominant trunk. And if you look at our native white pine, you can see the same thing that, you know, the, uh, the growth favors the formation of a single trunk with a dominant leader, and the lateral branches are horizontal in relationship to that vertical trunk. But what's interesting in the springtime when the candles come out, all the candles are vertical, but then over time the lateral uh, candles move into a horizontal position in response to uh, the chemical signals from the leader. And over time you get this classic form of the uh, Pinus strobus, the white pine. Uh, but if something happens to that leader, in this case, the uh, there's a weevil, the white pine weevil killed this uh, leader. The lateral branches don't get their signal and as opposed to moving into a horizontal position, they continue to grow uh, vertically. So it's as though the, the king is dead and uh, you know the vassals now have to uh, duke it out for who's gonna become dominant. And when that happens, you get what's known as a wolf tree, where, you know, which is a tree with multiple leaders that uh, consumes the resources that several trees uh, would under normal circumstances. And of course, uh, this is the Honeywell Estate in Wellesley. You can, people can insert themselves into the form of a tree, but uh, let the buyer beware. Uh, this garden uh, is called the Italian Garden was established in the 1850s. So they've been pruning these trees like this for a uh, hundred and seventy years. So once you insert yourself into the form of a tree, you take full response. There's no going back. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to let these things uh, uh, figure it out for themselves now. No. So, you know, pruning is a one-way street and uh, it's not something that I advise people to go down unless uh, they have a, a, an army of gardeners to help them or, um, you know, they really know what they're doing. Uh, looking at a sugar maple uh, in fall color, this is what it's like in the Berkshires right now. It's just sensational. But if you look at it in the winter time, you can begin to see uh, its form. You can see that the, there's an equivalency of, of, in, between the trunk and the branches, and they're all essentially vertical. So unlike the conifer where you had a clear dominant central leader and secondary branches in the sugar maple model, uh, all of the branches are essentially vertical and equivalent, and uh, that can become quite extreme over time. But this is the way sugar maples often look, particularly when they're grown as specimens. But when you have all those branches uh, coming out of one common point right here, that causes structural problems. And that's where sugar maples, they all fall apart. So we had that hurricane that came through here in August, and it just did a number on the old sugar maples because most of them, uh, particularly the ones planted along the roadsides for sugaring, uh, were rotten to the core, and they just split right down the middle when hit with those high winds. And you can see uh, what's amazing about a lot of these is not only were they rotten, but they were filled with these uh, roots on the inside, these endocollis roots. So that a phenomenon of trees uh, sort of digesting their own rotten heartwood is much more common than people uh, realize and it becomes uh, evident when you have a big storm like we had on August 4th. And uh, looking at another example of the same type of model, but it's a little bit different, the white oak. This is a young white oak. And then this is an incredible specimen at the Arnold Arboretum. And you can see that, yes, there's only one trunk there, but it actually occupied the space of probably 10 different trees if it was grown in a forested situation. So this is what happens when you grow a tree as a specimen. It expands to fill the space available. This is all reiteration. Of course, uh, this is not the Arnold Arboretum, but this is uh, sort of the fourth model I'm going to talk about, the flat-topped acacia trees in the Serengeti. If you're lucky enough to ever be there, you, it's, it's an amazing uh, environment. And those, that's the, the shape of these trees is iconic for uh, the savanna-like conditions throughout the world. And we have our own uh, trees that have this same form, the uh, honey locust here um, in Boston near the Landmark Center. 
they're in the same family. The Fabaceae is the um, acacia trees. And you can see when you look at the crown, it's very much the same thing. And this is, I've talked about sympodial branching. This is what the crown of a honey locust looks like. And how do you make a crown when there are no vertical branches in here? Essentially, everything is horizontal. And this is really the same is true of the American elm. And essentially, uh, you're piling branches atop one another. So essentially, you have a, a branch that goes horizontally, and then a new shoot comes off the top of that. And it just keeps piling uh, branches one atop another. Uh, a good, another example of, a, of um, a growth form that's common at the flowering dogwood, you're all aware of how beautiful that is. And, but, you know, they're also very hard to prune. So you can see these trees, if they've been damaged, they have trouble making a new leader. They can't do it the way a, an oak or a, a maple will. And even this beautiful Kusa dogwood grown in the middle of a lawn, it still puts most of its energy into its horizontal branches. The tree doesn't get taller over time. It becomes wider over time or this uh, pagoda dogwood, you can see that the central trunk there is incredibly thin and all of the growth is going into the horizontal branches. So in this model, the, uh, it's the branches that dominate and the trunk is really there just to uh, support the branches. So trees that grow in the understory of forests typically have this uh, dogwood style of branching. And I talked about sympodial branching. This is what it looks like. It's called relay branching, where it's not the activity of a single meristem just growing out. Uh, one meristem replaces another over time. And this is the branching you get uh, in these trees that are essentially horizontal. Uh, in the orientation of their branches. And of course, some of you might be familiar with the little bunchberry, Cornus canadensis. It just, that's like the lateral branch of a flowering dogwood tree growing by itself with no trunk whatsoever. It has exactly the same form. So it's kind of uh, going full cycle from, you know, how you, you're starting off as a tree and how you get reduced down to a little herbaceous perennial like this bunchberry. And this is my last slide here. And then I'll take some questions, but it's a little complicated, but you can see here, this is the growth of the tree right here. Follow my cursor, it grows like this. And then something happens to it, it reiterates. Uh, one of the reiterations becomes dominant, it becomes a, a sort of a, a nice, healthy, vigorous tree. And then you come down here and then another tree grows up next to it, it shades it, it loses its vigor. Uh, it might reiterate or it might die and then, uh, you know, grows up, then the crown begins to reiterate as it reaches the canopy, but then there's one nearby uh, that can go into decline. It might even die, but if something happens to the neighboring tree, it recovers, it reiterates, and then when it reaches the canopy, it begins to really proliferate its uh, broad crown through this process of reiteration. And that's sort of a summary of what we've seen, you know, in this tree's amazing ability to respond to environmental uh, stress. So that's my last slide. And I think that I can um, uh, take some questions now. I hope I wasn't too much uh, information for you, but it's, it's not an easy topic to sort of understand, but hopefully you get an appreciation for how trees grow and how to look at trees. So whoever is in charge, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, and we can, I can take some questions. Uh, Peter, we had a, a question from Shelly Henderson, like where was the garden south of San Francisco? Filoli in Woodside. And Filoli is a, it's, it's an old Irish expression, fight, love, and life. <laughs> It's an amazing garden. And um, it's, if you're interested in pruning, it's one of the great places to go. It's really uh, extraordinary. And um, that's where it is. So if you go to San Francisco, it's about an hour south of San Francisco. Okay, the next question we had is, we had an oak hit by lightning in August. The red line goes from top to the bottom. Can you talk about this type of stress lightning hit on a tree? Well, we have, um, you know, trees at the Arboretum are not infrequently hit by lightning. And um, 
sometimes it's, uh, you know, it just will blow the bark off the tree. Uh, sometimes the tree will, uh, you know, part of the tree will die. Sometimes the whole tree will die and then it'll sprout from the base. And sometimes the tree will show no effect whatsoever. There was a tree not too far from my house here in, in uh, the Berkshires where this hickory tree was hit by lightning. The lightning went down and followed the root system. And then uh, the root was, uh, there was a downspout from a gutter. Uh, the lightning jumped from the root system of the tree to the house, set the house on fire, burned to the ground. And the hickory tree is still standing there as though nothing ever happened to it. So it's really hard to say uh, what's gonna happen to that oak tree. But, um, you know, if it lost a lot of its bark, then it's probably, you know, a good idea to remove it. But if it didn't lose bark, I would leave it and wait and see what happens. Because it's possible that um, the trees recover fine from that. The next question is from Ready for the Arbor Day Stewardia seedling gift from the Arboretum last year. Got a good start in our yard until some hungry animal ate it to above the ground level during the winter. How can you avoid such a fate for future seedlings? Well, usually you're gonna put a little uh, collar around it. They sell these plastic collars that are about a foot tall. And even if it, it, it's taller than the plant itself, there's still light coming in the top. Or, you know, if it's a, you know, a little bit bigger, you can put some chicken wire around the base to, it's usually rabbits that are doing the, the damage rather than mice, but, you know, uh, you do have to protect that trunk. And then also there's this thing called lawnmower disease and also it works against the trees. So you got to put some protection around the base of the tree, particularly when they're young, because if a weed whacker hits a tree, that'll, that's the same as a rabbit chewing it. So, uh, but don't give up on it. Maybe the seedling will sprout back and uh, it's young enough that you won't even notice that it, um, it got chopped off uh, at an early age. The next question is from Pam Baruti. It says, how does reiteration work or does it for catastrophic traumas like wildflowers or floods? Well, what's interesting is these uh, wildfires in California, um, you know, uh, is, they're not a new thing, but the, the frequency and the intensity is, is new. And a lot of the uh, tree species that uh, are native to California are adapted to fires, not at the frequency that they're occurring. And they essentially, I showed the picture of that lignotuber in the linden. A lot of the California species will produce uh, these lignotubers that essentially are uh, a safeguard and insurance policy against uh, trauma. In this case, it's fire, but it can also be work against flooding. So the California redwood, the California buckeye, the bay laurel, they all produce these gigantic lignotubers. And when the tree is cut or it's damaged by fire, uh, they will sprout back. So those forests are fairly um, resistant. But, uh, you know, in, in, in the old days, the, the fire, the return cycle was on the order of every 40 to 50 years. And what we're seeing now is that, that the return cycle for the fire is happening more frequently. So they're getting more frequent fires and that's harder for trees to uh, deal with. And the, the, the flora known as chaparral in California, that's used to being burned every five to 10 years. That's the shrubby, uh, the manzanitas and things like that. And they can be burned very frequently and will come back. So the California flora, this is the native California flora is uh, well adapted to fire. But what we're seeing now is at the higher elevations, uh, you've got a lot of conifers that are not adapted to fire and those are really causing problems. They've been killed by the pine beetle and stuff like that. So uh, while there is some natural resilience built into the system, uh, what's happening now is sort of overwhelming. E this, the, the native system can't keep up with the, the climate change, particularly the drought. Uh, that's really hard for a lot of these species to tolerate. Um, would you recommend any special actions to take mm -hmm. care of for old trees in our changing environment? I hate to draw analogies between trees and people, but you know what old trees resent deeply is any change in their environment. They don't do not like change, okay? So don't 
go in there and radically alter things, leaving things the way they are. You know, a lot of people will have a beautiful tree in their backyard or something. They say, oh, I want to feature this. And they start cutting down trees to make it more visible. And I'm, I'm a little superstitious. I always feel that when you do that, next thing you know, that tree's going to get hit by lightning, you know? So I'm a big believer in leaving things alone. And the more stable they are for an older tree, the better it likes it. But to go in there and start pruning it and feeding it and stuff like that, I think you're um, taking a risk, um, despite what the arborist may tell you. Um, you know, trees don't need like injections of nitrogen. Uh, they get their nitrogen through, you know, the symbiotic association with fungi, mycorrhizal fungi in the root system. And as long as the forest floor is intact and undisturbed, that mycorrhizal system is intact. And that's what's feeding that tree. And so you don't want to do a lot of soil disturbance around an old tree because you're disrupting its, uh, its uh, mechanism for getting these mineral nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And you know, injecting them directly into the trunk of the tree is not the same thing. Next question is, uh, what trees would you rec recommend planting now that you would not have chosen in the past? And are there any you would recommend no longer planting here in New England? Well, this is, uh, you know, this is, these, are, these are not easy questions I'm being asked. Um, you know, and the climate change is a, is a huge issue, obviously. That's, a, you know, our winters are getting, uh, you know, shorter and warmer. And, the problem is with, with climate change is, you know, all of the research says that the big winners with climate change are the pests and the pathogens. And we're seeing that now as, you know, things like the emerald ash borer, which has been in Boston now for about three or four years, are killing, you know, all of our ash trees. So green ash is a fairly common street tree. I don't plant any more ash trees because They've got a big bullseye painted on them as far as this emerald ash borer is concerned. And I don't have to remind anybody about Dutch elm disease. And, um, you know, so the, the, you know, our forests, and if you look at the, you know, our New England forest, they're, they're whole, we still have forests and they're in pretty good shape, but the composition of the forest today bears no relationship to, you know, what they were 200 years ago. It's, yes, it's still a forest, but, it's a totally different kind of forest because the conditions have changed. But in the urban environment, my advice is not to get hung up on native versus non-native because the urban environment is not a native environment. There's nothing native about being in the city. And what you really want is trees that will tolerate the stressful conditions in the urban environment. Not, you know, that should be the criteria, not was it growing here before the pilgrims landed. We need trees that can tolerate uh, urban conditions. And, you know, there's a lot of good native species, but there's an awful lot of good non-native species. I mean, the honey locust is a great tree for urban conditions. I mean, it's native to the southeastern United States, but it's not native to New England. So people call it a native species, but it's really not. And so, you know, that's a good tree. Um, you know, the pin oak is not really native to New England. It was planted here. That's a great tree. And so I think we need to um, look for adaptable trees that aren't going to be invasive. So I'm not in favor of planting Norway maple. Uh, I don't think we should be planting the uh, calorie pear tree anymore. But I do think that there are, we just need trees that are tough and adaptable. And whether it's native or not, that's a secondary issue as far as I'm concerned when it comes to urban planting. Thank you. The next question is your, uh, the interest in Studardias. They are beautiful. I have one that's dying. We were told due to deep root flare will exploding the fair at this point uh, help revive it. Boy, these are these questions are great questions. Uh, the thing about Stuardia, it's in the tea family, the same tea that you uh, like to drink, um, the Thaeaceae, and they're, the tea family members are like the rhododendron family members. They have to have acid soil conditions. Okay, so sometimes uh, Stuardias don't do well because the, the soil is too sweet. So if there's any concrete structure nearby that may be leaching calcium, 
that could work against the stewardia. So I would check your soil pH in the vicinity of the stewardia first and foremost, and it should be, you know, it, shouldn't, it certainly should be lower than six. If it's higher than six, that's a sort of a problem. And, you know, somewhere between four and five is probably perfect. Sometimes trees are planted too deeply or they're planted at the right level and then because the root ball is heavy, they settle and they, they go below the, um, you know, they, they're too deep. And so exposing, uh, taking some of the soil away to, to get that original root flare back and then covering it with coarse mulch, that might help. But I would check the soil pH first. Next one is we planted several uh, six feet hollies last spring and the drought has seemingly done them in with excessive leaf loss. Will they come back? Well, when an evergreen, when an evergreen, when the leaves all turn brown, that's a very bad sign. Um, you know, if they turn brown in the summer, uh, you know, in July or August, that's probably fatal. Uh, but if it if it happens late in the season, like uh, September or even October, they they can actually be deciduous and come back. Uh, but they have much more. You know, when it happens in midsummer, that's 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 a really bad sign. But if it happened later in the summer, I mean, there's there's even conifers, uh, things like um, the cedar of Lebanon under extreme uh, winter conditions, it'll lose all of its needles and you think it's dead and then bingo, it produces a new set. But it really, the tree has to have had time to produce a new set of leaves that are still in the bud. And if that happens in summer, it does, they're not gonna be an extra set of leaves there. But if it happens in the fall, the tree might have enough time to produce an extra set of leaves. And the other one is, how does this summer lack of water affected young and old trees? <laughs> this is terrible. This is, it's a, it's a horrible, you know, trees need water. And, um, you know, uh, my own strategy, you know, I'm in the Berkshires now, but I live in Watertown. So, uh, you know, I'm right in there with all of you guys in Brookline. Um, you know, when it gets, when we go about, a, you know, a week or 10 days without rain, I begin to water by hand. I don't use any sprinklers or anything like that to make sure that the water, you know, keep that surface of the soil a little bit moist because, you know, if you go too long with, without rain, what happens is the, the soil becomes over dry and then the water can't penetrate. It, can't, it, it just, the, the soil just sheds the water and you need a heavy rainstorm before any of that water gets in there. So uh, this is the problem with an extreme drought is that the soil surface will actually shed the water over time. So making sure that they, you don't get to these, these super dry conditions where, you know, we haven't had much rain in a month, basically. So that's really treacherous. So you never want to let your soil get too dry. And even just putting a little bit of water on there will keep that surface wet so that when it does rain and it rains a tenth of an inch, at least that tenth of an inch will go into the ground. The other thing is everybody likes ground covers, but Ground covers, when you only have a little bit of water, the ground cover takes all that moisture and none of it goes to the trees. So things like vinca, you know, I, I've been ripping that out of the ground around my trees because it, it's actually competing with the tree when it comes to uh, drought conditions like this. So the drought is really, uh, you know, can be a very serious problem and it, and it works particularly for young trees and uh, old trees also. So it's, those are the two ends that are most susceptible. Um, if you are replanting trees, can you recommend any native local varieties? Well, there's, uh, you know, there's some great trees out there. The oaks, you know, are, are sort of probably the most common New England species is, you know, the old standby, the red oak, the pin oak, the black oak. I love the swamp white oak. That's Quercus bicolor. That's uh, turns out to be a uh, very resilient tree. It does actually pretty well as a, as a, as a street tree. Um, I think the, uh, you know, tupelo is a good tree and they, that used to be considered hard to, to move and stuff like that, but now you can sort of buy it in containers. Uh, I think that there's sweet gum, you know, it depends, if, you know, if you're talking about your own yard, there's no limit to what you can grow except the size. You don't want a giant tree. Don't plant a silver maple or something like that. But if you're talking about a, you know, the street, that's one thing. 
a big park is another environment, and then the residential scale. So those are the three scales. So it's it's really you know how big do you want this tree to be, and uh, you know it needs to fit the space because if you put you know a silver maple on the street, that's going to lift the sidewalks and stuff. So getting the right tree in the right place is is really important. And in, in relation to your house, you know I, I like these medium to small size trees, not not the big. I love oaks, but they do get huge. Next one is, uh, one of my roadies is blooming. The buds are full. Will this defeat its blossoms in the spring? <laughs> the same thing happens to magnolias. Oftentimes will bloom in the fall. And you see that uh, cherry trees will bloom around Christmas time. A precocious blooming. And what happens, this is an indicator that it's a hybrid species, that it's not really a natural species. And so the regulation, the control mechanisms on its flowering are screwed up. And so it is, uh, it's producing, you know, it's, it's just a few of the flowers. It's usually not putting on its full display. So yes, they will come out of the flowers that were scheduled for the spring, but it's usually not that many of them. Uh, but it is a indication of a hybridity and uh, you know, these are domesticated plants. They're not really wild plants. I don't see any more questions in here, but I know that some people may not be comfortable with using the chat function. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay, we're gonna throw it open to everybody. Yeah. Hopefully chaos won't ensue. You'll have to unmute yourself, Victoria. We put in a, an autumn glory maple about four years ago. Uh -huh. and it has taken hold. It is growing. It is doing very well, but it does not go into autumn glory. It turns brown and dies. Now we are on the seashore and we keep being told just a little bit longer and it will go into glory. But is it the wind and the salt water or something other? Does it need a ring of water around it? We do have a watering system, but it doesn't have its own ring of water. Well, the autumn glory, that's an acer rubrum, I believe. That's a red maple, also known as the swamp maple. So that likes, you know, uh, moisture. Um, and the thing about uh, water, you know, as we know, the you know, the fall color, everybody was predicting that because of the drought, the fall color was going to be off. But we got a little bit of rain, you know, here in the Berkshires about, you know, two weeks ago, and all of a sudden the fall color is great. So fall color is dependent upon the conditions that prevail right at the time when the, the, the leaves are turning color. So you can make up for, a, you know, very bad year when it comes to fall color if you have good conditions in the fall. Um, I would say the other thing is these, a lot of these uh, selections, this, hort, this autumn um, blaze or whatever the name of the, your cultivar is, they're selected not necessarily from New England, but they might be from the Midwest. They could be from the Southeast. And so we don't know exactly you know, what, what conditions they're adapted to. So they may need a longer growing season to actually turn that, get their full color. And it may be get too cold in New England before they develop their full color. So it might be a cultivar that, particularly if you're on the coast and you've got that salt air and you've got a lot of wind blowing, those are conditions that red maple really doesn't like. It needs a little bit of protection. So, uh, I'm not advocating moving it, but I think whoever suggested waiting, wait and see. Uh, yeah, don't, you know, trees do take time to adapt to their surroundings. So don't give up on it yet. Thank you. Any other questions? I can't believe I, these are some very tough questions. Your group is uh, extremely knowledgeable. You're really pushing my, uh, limits of my uh, knowledge, basically. Oh, Cynthia, yes. Yes, I'm wondering if uh, they had done a kind of preventive job of taking out a lot of the uh, undergrowth in the forests in California. Do you think that might have helped? Um, we call that forest management. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about the Sierra Nevada mountains. We're talking about the coast range. We're talking about, 
you know, millions upon millions of acres. And when people talk forest management, I think what our president is referring to is more logging, um, not management. It's cutting more trees for, you know, economic uh, purposes. Um, that's not forest management. That's, that's more uh, logging. And, you know, it's a conundrum because, you know, one of the things about climate change is we now realize that um, we need these trees uh, to fix carbon. So cutting trees is uh, counterproductive because not only are you, you know, uh, using those trees and burning them for fuel or whatever, but you're also then, you know, cutting back the forest and those forests take 30 or 40 years to grow and they grow back. So planting a tree is not the same as cutting a tree. You know, it takes 30 or 40 years for a tree to begin to pay for itself. So what, um, you know, the thing is, is that yes, forest management could make a difference, but what's really happening in California is it's getting hotter and drier. Yeah. That's really the driver. It's not really about forest management, which isn't to say that you could reduce the, the risk, particularly in, in the vicinity of where people live. That's what there I should be more forest management, but in terms of doing it on a scale, you know, of the entire, you know, Sierra Nevadas or the coast range, that's, that's not possible. And no, but, but I realize a lot of people are now really building in these fire zones. And well, so, that's a big part of the problem. That's a huge part of the problem, the interface between the forests and because that's where the land, the housing in California is so expensive, that's where the land is still affordable. And that's why people are doing it is because they can, they can afford to do it. So it's, it's really, you know, a lot of these problems, we want to think of them as ecological problems, but they're, they're as much sociological as they are ecological and you know we have to deal with the sociological aspects of it as well as the ecological aspects any other questions well peter a, thank you so much That's well i hope it, i hope you enjoyed it and you'll look at trees a little bit differently now uh, yes thank you so much this is Terrific. You've gotten a lot of uh, thank yous on the chat. Yeah, oh, well, we're I, uh, really enjoying this last hour. It's been very insightful. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate the comment and it's been my pleasure to uh, get to spend this time with you guys. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. We love oh, your 